Welcome to the Spring 2021 Online Visiting Writer Series presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. It's a time of new beginnings for us and for the nation. We're thrilled to start the season with Natalie Diaz, poet and 2020 National Book Award finalist. Her new collection, Postcolonial Love Poem, was the number one most acclaimed poetry book of 2020 based on an aggregation of major publications and literary journals. That's according to the notable literary website, Lit Hub. The book is available for purchase via a link on this screen from the Independent Book House of Stuyvesant Plaza. And you can find out a lot more about Natalie Diaz and her work on this page. We're also thrilled to have here with us, Joshua Bartlett, who is zooming in from thousands of miles away in Ankara, Turkey, where he's assistant professor of American culture and literature at Bill Kent University. As a PhD student in the English department at UAlbany, Josh was a member of the New York State Writers Institute's team from 2012 to 2016. Josh wrote a review of post-colonial love poem for the blog of Plowshares, one of America's leading literary journals. Josh, it's great to have you back virtually. Thanks so much, Mark, and thanks for the, the invitation. It's, it's nice to be part of the, the Writers uh, Institute again. So we'll, um, we'll have uh, Josh take it away. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Natalie, for, for being here. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to get a chance to, to talk a little bit with you about, about your work. Um, I've, I've read your work and taught it and kind of shared it with people for, for a long time now. So, um, so thank you. Yeah, gracias um, for having me. So I, I wanted to kind of, of start um, with a question um, about uh, words, uh, which is, is maybe fitting for a, a kind of discussion about poetry um, and, a, and a term that's, that's familiar to you. Um, you often invoke the word lexicon uh, when you describe your relationship to language, to etymology, to translation, um, even to, to poetry itself. Um, and, and particularly in post-colonial love poem, your work to me seems to be kind of constantly exploring and negotiating uh, not only the tensions, but also that the possibilities that this term suggests. Um, and I'm hoping that, that maybe you can start by kind of saying a bit more about how this idea of the lexicon kind of first emerged in your thinking, um, why it's kind of uniquely important for you and, and maybe where your relationship is with that word or that concept now, um, kind of after, after this, this particular manuscript. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's, it's really an important word to me. Um, and I say that as someone who I spend a lot of time in constellations of words. Um, and in a way in post-colonial love poem, I let that manifest. Like I didn't, I let myself sit and return and spin and cycle and migrate through um, several of the, of the same words. Um, and for me, the lexicon, it's important in, in, many, in many ways. One, I'm, I'm very much, you know, as most poets are, um, kind of obsessed with the lexicon and uh, that first lexicon being um, related to uh, what has become English but has moved backwards. So we move often between the Latin and the Greek and you know sometimes we shift and it's like oh this is Sanskrit or this is Old Norse or something. Um, but when I first encountered lexicon it was in relationship to my indigenous language reclamation work. And the lexicon was, um, it was basically the, like a vocabulary list in which that they were uh, viewing my people and our values in language. And so there was something almost immediate in, in terms of what I wanted to resist of what lexicon first meant to me or, or how it was first given to me. Um, and thinking a lot about, um, the lexicon as being, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of um, recitation, 
you know, like, hey, these are the things that we're going to ask you about your language so that we know your language versus your language is going to be one way that I learn to know you. Um, and, and kind of, I think when I think of lexicon, I'm also thinking a lot about knowledge and where knowledge exists in the lexicon. So for me, I think of it as a kind of physicality. It's more the body than it is the language. So it's, it's the, the words that in some way are trying to carry or trying to touch the body or to stay in touch with the body. And I mean, if you follow it all the way back, I mean, it, it began, lexicon began being uh, like associated with the idea of the book. So of course we then begin to think of the eye and font and script and text. And as you follow it further back, it was about speaking. So it was about the physical word. And that in between that gap, you know, this is, I'm native, so I do have to say everything in a long, long time ago, Natalie thought this, but that first encounter, I guess, with lexicon as being uh, a list of vocabulary words uh, with which they wanted to pin my people down uh, through language, but through the English language and kind of following that all the way back to when it was a physicality, it was a physical manifestation of the body toward you know, an other body. Um, so, so for me, having that, the words that feel physical to me in this book, light, you know, needing to make light physical, the, the word body itself, uh, the word touch itself, you know, water, um, all of the different um, physicalities that in some ways all link back to the same, maybe four, four to five words. So, um, those are the, kind of the ways I think about it. I think of also the lexicon of, uh, as being very much related to indigeneity. So your connection to land and water. I mean, where you are in Ankar right now, like language developed differently. So the lexicon, the physical lexicon, the, the lexicon of light, the lexicon of water are so different there. Um, and I've had the luck of being in some of those places and on some of those lands versus where my lexicon developed. Like I have a lexicon of desert, very different from other people's or, or of water because of the river. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of a long, a long, long answer, but, and maybe one I'll never have the actual answer to, but that word itself is still a door that I, I'm able to enter again and again. No, that, that's great. You, you um, actually mentioned that one of the, the, the particular, um, words I, I wanted to ask about or sort of, of ideas is the water um, that appears um, in in the in the collection um, both the kind of physicality of it um, but you sort of conveniently for for my question use the word fluid um, and and you move back and forth between different ways of um, naming it different ways of calling it um, not only in different different languages um, but representing it as um, as a geological entity as a um, as a body in and of itself as almost a person um, with with a name um, and I, I, I maybe wonder if you you could talk a little bit more about that um, kind of importance of of water or or maybe the kind of of way that it is so heightened by the contrast with, with what you're all also calling your, your desert lexicon, um, the way that those kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, I feel like water is one of, one of our, just as like, as a, a human or flesh body, it's one of our most important languages and ways of touch. We don't often think about it in that way because it is a commodity, it's something you can buy now, it's a, a, a resource. So um, we've forgotten, I, I feel like we've forgotten, and I say that because I feel like I'm always trying to remind myself um, or allow myself to be reminded of, of the ofness of our lives, um, that I am of the water. Um, I think a lot about, um, I'm really interested in film and the moving image. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but I've been 
I've been trying to take the ways I think about language and poetry into moving images. So I've been making a lot of images of my river um, and my body in my river, my partner's body in my river. And I feel like, I mean, something that I think a lot about is, uh, you know, when two people meet, like you and I, I don't, I don't know you. I know the generosity you've shown my book. Um, I know some of the generous and rigorous ways I've seen you think about other writings. And yet here we are across this space. And it seems like I'm like, I think what is it that I recognize of you that lets me speak or understand myself, even though I think I'm understanding you. And sometimes I think it, we just pretend it's just our eye. Like I see, and I, I see this thing. And in some ways I'm able to recognize it because it, it is like me or it is not like me. But I, I often wonder, like, I think there are other things in our bodies that are recognizing one another or that are in conversation. And I think one of those things is water. You know, I think there's a way that the water recognizes me, um, you know, and knows I am of it and that it is in me. And I think this applies to, to all elements. I think, especially when we're talking about surveillance and technology, I think it copper, Galena, I'm thinking of all of these, um, these elements that I, I wonder how much of us as a life force is actually in conversation. Um, and what, what does that mean then to open up the idea of text or the idea of writing uh, to the body again? Like, you know, ink, ink is made of bodies. Um, I mean, I think I spent like an entire year just researching old ink recipes because I, even though they're, all, they're often the same, but that they're, you know, they're made of bone and ash and like all of the different things that they're, they're made of. And even our paints here in the river, you know, uh, all of the pigments, the, the clays, the, you know, and all activated by water. Uh, sometimes the water from your mouth, which is at some point the water from the river. I was reading a thing online, um, someone, and I, I should probably know their name, but it's on my Twitter page. Someone had posted, they were talking about the Inland Empire because a lot, I mean, basically our water is all um, spoken for foot by foot. Uh, um, and so a lot of our water goes up into the Inland Empire and, and sustaining a farming practice that, that can't, it's not sustainable. You know, that's the crazy thing about sustainability is it says it doesn't mean anything except we're determined to sustain it, no matter how illogical it is, right? But we call it sustainability and everyone thinks it's great. But they were just talking about how even people in the Inland Empire have been referred to as reservoirs of water. And the idea that uh, uh, water that reaches a river has already passed through, I think it was like two to three people like literal bodies by mm -hmm. the time it arrives there. And like, and so I just, you know, it's also like thinking of air, like you had mentioned, you had mentioned that I had mentioned the word fluid, um, but, but even that air is a kind of a fluid. And so I guess for me, water, I know I speak of it in some ways as if it seems like it is with, within or without, but I, I the like air and water and this idea of the fluid, it's, it's almost like you can't stop touching it. Like, like what does touch become if you are always already touched? So I, I guess mm -hmm. I'm thinking a lot about that and it feels difficult for me. It feels rigorous to try to put that into language on the page, to try to uh, not subvert, but to find other language by going through some of those really blanket words like metaphor, you know, um, like, I don't even know if a metaphor can actually happen, but instead we put all of these almost like, you know, uh, filters around our body. Whereas I think language can be so much more than that. And in, in thinking about the river, you know, our river, we say like hi sma, which means our river is asleep. Like we have all of these ways of speaking about it the same way we might speak about people we love. Um, so yeah, it's, and it's, you know, very straightforwardly, it's, you know, Hamakab, I've written about it and spoken about it. Like I have a belief that the river is in me and 
And I think, again, like I'm always saying, this isn't a metaphor because I feel like I've been raised in a world where the metaphor doesn't exist. You don't need it. And so I think that's something to think about uh, in terms of, of water, that it's, it's just a, it's a great connector. Um, even in terms of connecting all of our lands, we, you know, we, we, we have easier access to buying lands even though of course we've, we've pretty much put a price tag on all of the water, but I think in some ways water is, is the connector and, and land is somewhere, uh, you know, in the middle of it or related to it. Um, yeah, I got a course with that, I know, but uh, yeah, you've given me a generous space to think into, so. I, I, I actually wanna ask a little bit more um, about what you were saying about, um, Metaphor. Uh, this is this is one of the questions that I've I've been thinking about, and and particularly in um, kind of trying to turn um, some of these thoughts or some of the the kind of sense of things that you're you're describing um, into into poetry, um, right? In the in the sense that in in some way um, that that sense of water, for example, is um, has a kind of traditional way that it's frowned upon in the Western tradition, or we call it the pathetic fallacy, or we dismiss anthropomorphism as, as kind of weak poetics. And not only with the natural world, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the ways that, for example, um, you know, you, you have a line in the, in the collection when you um, are talking about basketball, this is the 10 top 10 reasons why Indians are good at basketball, where you say a, a basketball has never been just a basketball, where it, it kind of, um, to me at least, it, it sort of plays with the idea that um, the basketball is then going to be a metaphor, or basketball itself is going to be um, a metaphor, and um, it almost seems to want to kind of not trick the reader into into making that kind of simple move, but get them almost to the point and then um, show them a different way that isn't simply metaphor, that doesn't kind of um, turn the natural or turn the physical into um, simply the, the symbolic. Um, in that way, I, I guess if, if there's a sort of question there, I'm, I'm wondering um, if there are kind of other challenges that you have in in writing and communicating, um, or, or even in, in your work um, teaching, uh, perhaps about kind of, of getting um, readers and poets to, to think in those different different ways, not just yourself, but, but, but others. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, um, we have this uh, program at the center and with my students called Migrating the Loop. And so we've brought in um, several artists and scholars and, and they loop around the text and the text, the first text we chose was uh, Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being. And so it was, uh, it was, it was a beautiful gathering um, and kind of a collective imagining uh, alongside the text or within or through the text. And um, In Song Kim um, gave a talk on metaphor, which was really you know, it, it led to this kind of discussion that's still resounding, I think, through my students, but also uh, yeah, the other guests who were there. And, you know, thinking about metaphor and putting pressure on metaphor. And, um, and then they've actually recently uh, written an essay um, that they had already, of course, been working on, but brought pieces of that into the conversation. Um, and so I, it feels like an apt question right now because it's been on my mind a lot. Um, and I like, you know, metaphor is really interesting to me. And I tend to, one of the ways that I come to language is I always go backward, um, again, etymologically. And I feel like I have to go backward in English because it, I think it helps me maintain that relationship with the ways that I have learned. So, so there's something I think that I'm always, it's not, a, it's not a wrestle, but it's just a way that I exist is that I was taught in Mojave values 
in in the English language, which means sometimes there were certain subversions that had to happen, or sometimes there were, you know, certain improvisations. There were certain uh, refusals, um, and and of course, like a lot of conscription, like a lot of you know, um, and I think so. For me, this kind of backwards into an etymology. It, I guess it's my way of disallowing English to be as narrow as it is because I've seen how how capacious English can be when my language is uh, is being actuated within it. And this is always the this this I guess is the real intellectual battle for me is you know, so I, like I've, I've been recently writing an essay about writing in English and a lot of what I kind of encounter is like, well, English can't hold a lot of, of who I am and what my language is. You know, of course, knowing exactly that, you know, English developed and has sustained itself uh, very intentionally against so many of us and, you know, the, the violence as it carries. And then I also, I'm like coming to this space where I've watched like my elders, you know, the ways they live their lives. And, and I think how just one, like how fierce my Mojave language is in that it has been able to interact with many languages before English, like other, other indigenous languages from other tribes. Like we have so many in this Southwest area, we have so many words that are like, um, they're like almost like little Frankensteins of, of our different languages here, except like, again, Frankenstein has like a negative value, except, mm -hmm. you know, it's just to say like, our languages were migratory and they migrated into and out of one another. Um, and so there's also a part of me that wants to think about, uh, not that English is necessarily generous, but that my languages are capacious enough to uh, to shift English, to make it more. Um, and, and so metaphor, I think, comes into that. I think there's such a big problem with nouns and verbs. So you're asking like, even teaching, like that, that's like a sticking point for me is, you know, uh, and, and I say these as statements now, but I, you know, and as my students know, I can very easily shift them back, but you know, like one of the things I always tell them is like your, your adjective should work as a verb. Your adjective should happen. It's not standing outside watching or telling you because in Mojave, uh, like we don't have generic words for things such as walking, but you do say how they're walking. So, so the, 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 it's the happening, like trying to focus on the happening or the fact that a, the word for chair only exists because it's something we do. You know, so that that blurring between um, hinnak, hinnak, hinnak ve, like, well, you only need the word chair because it's something the body does. So the chair becomes a happening of the body. So those, the, the noun and the verb then are the same. Um, and so, you know, even I think, I think the, the word metaphor itself and how it tries to explain itself is also con in conflict. Because I think that, that there's a way that it holds itself to like thinking of uh, like transformation or transferring or carrying over. So mm -hmm. suddenly we're like two things that are not the same or, or the other then is made, um, you know, manifest or brought into some kind of clarity. But then there's also the way it's connected to words like carry or to bear. And that I think feels more natural to me of some of the, the ways that I've seen it described and that we're always carrying that possibility. We're always bearing it. And in Mojave, for example, we have a word called tu'ach, which is a really powerful word, but it just means that one physical body can become an other. Um, and it's not that they're both separate, they're both the same. So, you know, uh, a bird, has the possibility of becoming a human. So I think there's something about that word becoming, which is again, another part of this lexicon I've been spinning in the last few years that to me feels so important because it, it takes away the gap between two things. And it's so always becoming, like, like we are always becoming. 
I am always becoming and that, and that I am this and this should this happen. Um, and so, yeah, that, I mean, that's one of the ways I, I think about, about metaphor. Um, I think it's, it's such a fruitful place to have a conversation because, you know, off the page, like away from the poetic idea of it. And this is why I think poetry is really beautiful is you can be weirdly obsessive and intentional and, um, and overly attentive. But I do think metaphor is so related to things like empathy. Um, and they really let us get away with a lot if we're like, oh, well, this can be this. I can know how you feel. I can, you know, when, when for me, there's uh, the difference has to be able to happen simultaneously. So I guess maybe one more efficient way I could say is that I think metaphor tends to happen on a single line uh, or a single kind of dimension, whereas I think it actually exists on a, a, a plane, a many planed uh, space in which all of these things are happening at the same time. Uh, it just, it's a more of a matter of where our sensualities are directed. Often it's our eye. So if we can make the image, then the metaphor happens. However, uh, I think it, it's happening on, on a very different like uh, and, and you know, multi-located like sensual plane. No, sorry, these are like super long. <laughs> no, no, I'm 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 thinking in my super mind rapid. how I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to borrow that uh, for for my own students and try to try to reframe the the gap of metaphor as as a as a, as a different way of of them them seeing it. Um, yeah, and take a look at in songs. Um, I sent it to my students when it came out, but and I can follow up with the link to it. But it actually might be something that because this is part of the conversation people want to link to later but um yeah it's a really and it, I, she's just carrying it in so many different places um and also if you continue thinking about metaphor i would love to stay on track with you about it because it just feels like a really important place uh, in our lives that exist also off the page oh, absolutely um so i i um maybe kind of taking um that, that discussion of, of becoming a relation and, and empathy, but also the, the project that you're describing with, with your students. Um, one of the, the sort of parts of, of the book that I, I really love and that I had read um, previously were the inclusion of some of these uh, the letter poems that um, you and, and Alimon um, exchanged. Um, and I, I wanted to um, kind of ask about two um, terms here. One, the idea of, of collaboration um, and the way that it worked here, the way that you've spoken elsewhere um, about your kind of interested, interest in collaborating not only with poets and writers, but with artists and architects, um, but also this, this phrase that you use in the notes to the book, um, where you'll point to a particular line from a poem and you'll say that uh, this line is in conversation with Anne Sexton, or this line nods to uh, a, song, a particular song, song lyric. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm I'm wondering about those those two terms, collaboration and, and conversation, um, how they're similar to you while you're working, um, but also maybe what some of the the kind of direct or indirect differences are. Yeah, um, one that the the relationship that I have with with Ada is really special. Um, as like many of my relationships that have come through poetry. Um, and I think that's also kind of a testament. Sometimes people only see the outside of poetry, um, but it, it really is a way to live your life. Um, I mean, if you want to, or if you choose to, um, and it can also be all these other things at the same time or separately, this kind of, there's kind of a celebrity thing that happens. There's kind of a social media thing. There's you know, all the, all the different ways of performance that happen um, in any field, but I think sometimes feel very 
like profound in poetry because it is such a an otherwise like um, self reflective uh, kind of um, uh, self flogging even kind of like internal you know you're turning back and so I think sometimes what becomes the public or what you try to make of of like a a public private uh, and all those resounding performances that happen they do feel quite profound. Um, the, the relationship with Ada in terms of that collaboration, and I, for me, I think collaborations are one of the most difficult thing um, because I think a lot of people think they know what collaboration is, but I think it's different in every situation. And there's, a, there's a th always at least a third space that happens in a collaboration that, that is not even you, but is you you know, so there's the alongside with, right? Like that's some place, I, I like thinking of alongside because I, I feel like, uh, you know, I was raised alongside, like I only exist, you know, autonomy, it, 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 you know, this is very much a Mojave concept and, and maybe other indigenous um, um, thinkers and, and folks as well, but just like that my autonomy only exists in relationship to my family and my family is my community and my community is, you know, my people, um, you know, my, in my house of my family were also my cousins or also, you know, neighbors who needed a place to stay, but also my neighbors are my cousins or my uncles. And, and, you know, even the, the stranger on the corner is not a stranger, you know, he's Archie and he's not related to me and his dogs are really bad. So you have to be careful, but I know that I have to take care of him. Right, um, you know, or Beverly on the corner that if I, you know, see that she has fallen, I will walk her home, you know, like, and the, so there's a very different relationality um, that has affected and touched everything that I touch and interact with. And I think in, in terms of, of the way I've been built, I've, I'm built with group thinking. I mean, I play basketball. Um, I, I think of momentum and I think of touch as being essential to anything that happens. So I, I like noise, I like conversation. Um, I'm so lucky to be in so many conversations with, with people. Um, one of the projects we're working on right now, I'm working with my, uh, my mentor who is now my collaborator um, and a friend, Brian, Dr. Brian Brayboy at ASU. But, we're working on a project um, and I mean, many people are working on similar things. So I don't mean to say it's, you know, the only of its kind, but what is the collective imagination? Uh, you know, what is what we call an imaginative trust? Uh, what does it mean to think alongside and with and through? And can that happen? Because once things hit the institution, is when people begin to feel like, wait a minute, this was mine, or this was mine, or hey, you're coming across. And that's the part that I think is interesting about collaboration is, is, is that it's not just touch, it's, it's the convergence, but it's maybe most importantly, the divergence of those ideas and those ways. And what was really lucky about the poems in the book that were in relationship and conversation with Ada are that uh, there was there was no poetic frame set on it in that there was no product come at the end. So like you feel us and see us borrowing language and ideas and she would insert like Robert Creeley entered because that's who Ada was reading. So then suddenly I wanna be alongside her. So then I pick up Robert Creeley and start spending time with Robert Creeley, you know, who pops up in some way in the book or, um, and so to me, to me, that's, it's, it's essential because that's what language is, right? That's what any kind of language is. Like even right now, I'm going to leave this conversation and I'm going to, I'm like returning and migrating back to metaphor, having been changed by whatever seeds and pathways you've kind of furrowed just in this short conversation. And, and that's just something I'm very much open to. Um, I think it's, it is a lot for me about imaginative momentum. I think the imagination is a kind of momentum. 
that's very much like basketball that's very much like the way i grew up on the reservation and that in some ways it's um and i mean even like scientifically it goes back to like something i think atomic or molecular in that you're just constantly moving and in touch and being bounced from all these different energies and somehow in that you become and you're not still even though we try to you know that's one way we've been taught to think about ourselves as being a kind of stillness in this flesh body however there's there's always these kind of uh i mean i guess resoundings is one of the ways i one of the words that i throw around now but um but yeah it's a uh, and this, I think, even goes back to that idea of fluidity that popped up earlier. But yeah, I think it's a uh, it's collaboration is really important. And again, it's it's one of the hardest things because people are bringing lexicons that that don't match and that don't have to. Like I think sometimes you'll grow from them and become something different, and then sometimes you'll just sit next to each other and and you won't agree and you won't understand. But how do you make space for that to be a happening? Um, Valeria uh, Luiselli and I did a collaboration on uh, it was kind of like opening up uh, what is the credible fear questionnaire, and we have very different relationships with it. Um, you know, it's affected each of our families in different ways. Um, I, I live uh, on the Fort Mojave Indian Reservation. That's where I grew up, anyway, and then I'm also enrolled in. Uh, Gila River, so um, on the Akama Atham Reservation, but the Atham Reservation, the larger Atham Reservation, is right on the border. Um, and when I was younger, like my family, uh, we used to bring people back and forth, and even using, you know, I think the, um, uh, what do they call that when enough time has passed that you can't get in trouble for it anymore? Amnesty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think that enough time has passed that, that uh, I could be more specific but we, <laughs> just in case like uh i won't but you know and then the work valeria does but that was a collaboration where we were both bringing our worries and our fears as well as as our imaginations and our attentiveness uh and and stakes right like what we what did we want to wager of ourselves or one another but also this topic we were talking about knowing we weren't the actual bodies being affected by, um, you know, the border, um, or at least in some of those ways, um, or credible fear questionnaires, things like that. But that was a really difficult um, <clears throat> collaboration. It was, I mean, and I say difficult in that it pushed me to the limits of, of uh, ego. And I, I mean, ego in a way of like, who is it that helps me make the choices I make in my art that I feel like that's my ego. It's saying like, I'm excited about this, but my excitement doesn't necessarily have to manifest as, as certain, a certain voice or a certain perspective, or maybe the way it manifests is actually the thing I should be questioning. And so, um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I guess just to make sure I, I close the door on this one, I, I, I think in collaboration and the kind of uh, chaotic fuel of many voices. Um, and it is just the way I was, was raised, you know, across generations, across families. Um, so, but it is hard. It's, it's a place where I, yeah, but it's, it's a good hard, right? It's like, it's one of the few places I think where we allow ourselves to have attention around one another where we allow ourselves to say like, yeah, I don't know, I don't agree. And you might still do this, you know, um, and I will meet you at some point along it. Um, yeah. That's, that's great. Um, I have, I have so many more, more things I could ask. I know we're running a little short on, on um, time. I, I did want to kind of ask um, quickly, uh, maybe the, opposite of the kind of intimacy of collaboration that you're you're talking about um you you sort of of started by by kind of positioning collaboration as this um opposite to that that outside world of poetry or the the public world of poetry 
Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about the ways that, you know, in the past week, um, kind of following um, Amanda Gorman's poem at the, the US presidential inauguration, there's been a, a kind of great deal of uh, commentary, Twitter threads, um, et cetera, um, about um, this kind of role of public poetry or political poetry or activist poetry or um, not so much what we might have needed or expected the artists to do in the previous US administration, but um, what the responsibility of the poet is, is now. Um, and I've, I've seen you comment in, in other conversations and interviews about um, being a little bit cautious about the kind of direct line between um, writing and activism or poetry itself as, as activism. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering how you're, how you're thinking about kind of, of being a, a public poet, um, a, a political figure, a political poet, poet an activist poet um, in, in these moments, um, if, if that's something that's on your mind. Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, it, it's, it's, I'm assuming this will be helpful to y'all students. I know it will be helpful to my students um, because we talk a lot about this right now. You know, we're in a, we're in a space of deep reflection and uncomfortable reflection and also like a, a kind of, um, it's a restless reflection, right? I think, I think sometimes we think of reflection as being a calmness, you know, met, we, we kind of hold it next to meditation or like, but but reflection is, and maybe should always be, I don't know, it, it's uncomfortable. It's fragmented in a lot of ways, at least this is the way it's manifesting with my students, you know, with me. Um, but it's that time to like where my students are saying like, what does it even mean that I'm a poet? You know, or what does it mean that I'm studying poetry? Or what does it mean that, that this should amount to a book? Um, and that, I mean, in some ways that's, it's a, a failure, but it's also the thing that drives poetry in that it needs to be, it needs to feel available to more people. And I think that's one of the hardest things about the idea of the public poet is, is it's also, I mean, I feel like it's also my responsibility to put poetry where it's not because I once was that. I once was where poetry was not. Um, my family is where poetry is not, except through me. And so, you know, what what does that mean? And 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 is public poetry the and the way I mean is like on a kind of stage or in an academy or in an award ceremony? Like, is that really where poetry is happening? Um, and I think it's not happening there. Um, although that is, uh, again, an important performative moment of poetry. Uh, the inaugural poet is always going to be uh, controversial uh, as a, a role or a position because how does the state operate in poetry? Um, it's definitely, we don't live in a poetic state. Uh, we don't live in a poetic nation. Um, you know, it's a blood lyric, if anything, if we were going to try to start using poetic language uh, in relationship to it. Um, and it's, it's also, it's the nation's language in which most of us write poetry. Um, and the nation's language is also ours. You know, I, I think that's, that's all, it's like the Ouroboros. It's like, I am it, it is me, it's consuming me. I'm, I'm trying to get away from it. And yet I'm also the consumer. It's like, we're, we're kind of always spinning over. Um, one of the reasons why I keep looking down while we're talking is uh, I, I draw a lot and sketch when I'm talking, but I also am like a copious notes taker. So I have to be doing something physical to sit, um, but I draw word maps while we're talking. So I have all these little word maps, but I, but I was thinking a little bit about um, the idea of intimate, because we had, you had mentioned that and I had, you know, one of us mentioned it first, I don't know, but we were been bouncing around, but intimate. And I mean, intimate is a little bit dangerous because sometimes it can mean familiar. And we, so we accept the familiar as intimate um, or sometimes it even means in proximity in some way, uh, you know, like we think 
we say like, oh, I'm close to her, like, or we're intimates or, but I, I think there's also, there's also a way of thinking about it as not yet happening. So like, for me, the intimate might not yet be occurring. Like it's, it's what we might yet do or what we might yet learn. And, and that's something that I'm not even sure where to hold myself at. So like if thinking of intimacy and the idea of, of making something known, so we tend to hold it only in that one place where it's like, what is known, what's familiar. But I think that, that is something that, that feels important because, and I don't even mean that it's a future thing, right? Because I think future is now one of those words that we have to try to question. But if intimacy is the state that has not yet happened. So if it's whatever the relationship or energy or touching is that has not yet happened, then, then what might happen is the action. And that to me is why poetry is, is important and why a young black 22 year old woman reading a poem in front of a nation, even a nation that has done what it has done is so powerful because it might not be that moment, but it is how we might act. Like what is the action that language precedes? You know, I think that that is something that feels really important to me is, is the physicality of language is, yeah, there's a physicality when I'm making it, right? It's in my throat, it's in my ear, but when I speak it, there's an action out there that, that I haven't arrived at yet, that my, my words are in some ways, you know, reaching for. And so I, I guess where I've been lately is I push back a little bit against the idea that poetry is an activism. I think it, it can lead to action. I think it, and sometimes that action is just touching your own body. Uh, you know, Natasha Trethway and Joy Harjo read at an event for us last night. We had like the luck of being alongside them. And Natasha read um, The Miracle of the Black Leg, which I have, I've read in her book, Thrall, again and again and again. But I heard her read it out loud. It's the first time I ever heard her. And I wasn't even in the room with her. She was in her own home, you know, um, somewhere in the vicinity of, of Chicago. And I could feel myself breathing. And that, that's a small action, but to even to touch my chest or just to like, those are just small changes that now I woke up in a day different and a little bit closer to who knows what of, of action. Um, I think there's something that's difficult and, and my students and I talk a lot about this is that I don't know that poetry is a reaction. It's treated that way a lot. Um, and so I, I guess I wonder about that. I wonder about the againstness of poetry. You know, I think there were some of the critiques I saw about the inaugural poet. Some people were saying like, it's iterating the state. Like I'm iterating the state. We're here on like a, we're here on this digital platform and it's happening because we're digging up someone's backyard or we're hap it's happening because somewhere in Ghana, someone's going to have to dismantle all of this technology in a poisoned atmosphere. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it might be, I mean, Josh, I think it might be one of the more important questions we can ask about that. I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, Miguel, Miguel Hernandez, who went out and read his poems on the front line, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Spain during the war, like, like, what does that mean? You know, um, I was uh, recently in a conversation with Jackie Woodson, um, and I've seen some like public events, uh, like there's a, there was a political reading about Jericho, the walls of Jericho, like, you know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, it, it does feel like a really important question because it feels like it, it's not just about where poetry might go, but I think it, 
it, it will really determine who we offer poetry to and who we allow to have to have poetry. It can't just be enough that I'm a political poet because I'm one of very few natives or or you know Mexicans, Latinas, Latinx, uh, you know uh, queer people who get some attention. Like that can't be enough. That is not a change at all. That's a status quo. And so, but if my mom has poetry, to me that's a change. You know, if if my, the the kids on my reservation have it, that's a change. Um, otherwise, I'm just in some ways a status quo, like one of few. Um, yeah, I think I'm bouncing so far away from your question, uh, but it, it's such an important, important question. Also, I've been saying Josh, should I be saying Joshua? <laughs> Either is fine. But you, you go by uh, Joshua. I, yes. I pardon that, yeah. That's so, okay. Um, no, but yeah, I think Joshua, that's like a really important question um, that I'm sure people have asked again and again and again, uh, you know, through time. Um, yeah, and it's a real, I, you know, we said this last night, but it's a real labor. And if I think poetry should be a labor, not just on the page, but out there trying to move it into places. Um, yeah, that was a super long winded answer. No, it was, it <laughs> was one. I'm on a was... reservation, so I'm around old people. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is a four day answer. <laughs> Um, no, it was, it was wonderful. Um, and I, I think maybe that's, that's, I, I, again, we could continue. I have so many more things. Um, I think maybe that's kind of a good place to, um, to, to leave the conversation for, for the moments, um, on, on that kind of question. Um, thank you so much. This was, this was a wonderful conversation. I hope that we'll get to have more of it um in the future um, yeah definitely and like I, I would love to have you you know join us in some of our conversations and whether it's metaphor or not so so be thinking of you know some some words or things you'd like to press and we'd love to have you uh have you join us um so, yeah and then you know of course gracias to mark and to, to jennifer for putting this together um yeah it's it's yes. lucky to to join everybody here Yes. No, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, um, as well for, for giving me the opportunity um, to, to talk with really one of my my favorite kind of contemporary writers. Um, this yeah. was this was a really great yeah. moment for me. Gracias. And I don't mean to keep like ping ponging thank yous, but <laughs> uh, but uh, but also Joshua, like your 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 critical work. And I don't mean like I think sometimes we think of critical as having like a negative value to it but uh just like that that your criticality has such a care and attentiveness to it and it it's really important work so i would also like to encourage you know the students and whoever else is out there to, to really take a look at your work um it's been really important so i appreciate you know you doing all of that the book is post-colonial <laughs> love poem it's available for purchase from an indie bookstore here on this screen it's a wonderful way to begin your 2021 reading adventure. Thanks so much, Natalie Diaz and Josh Bartlett. Let me remind you all that uh, this and our other author interviews are posted on the Writers Institute's YouTube channel, and you can find them at the conversation on our website, newyorkstatewritersinstitute.org. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you wish to support further programming like this, you can make a donation to our website, newyorkstatewritersinstitute.org. We'd be very grateful. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be well. <laughs>